This is the Zarf 018.0 release update. Uh, so a few things would have changed this release. Uh, the last release was about a month ago. Uh, and in this release, one of the things we've been working on um, that's not technically in the release code itself, but it's related, is the Zarf website we have pulled up here. Uh, this is the first iteration, this MVP. We're gonna start adding more content to it. Um, right now it's links to GitHub, uh, links to the Slack, and, and then just links to the docs. Um, but where we're hoping to go with that um, it is to expand it with more content and eventually a full docs engine. We know that docs are a pain point with Zarf right now and we want to improve that. Uh, so that, that's coming uh, for a preview of what's coming with that. Um, you can kind of see where we're headed, um, where our, our brains are at as far as design. And, and we're looking at DocuSaurus and a few other documents engines. So open suggestions there, but the idea is we want to build a, a quality user experience around the docs, just like we've done around the CLI itself. Um, and we do feel like it is, it is insufficient right now. Uh, so more, more to come on that, but that's, that's working in parallel and is our website repo. The big feature for this release is actually around software build materials. Uh, SBOM has been uh, a big topic, obviously, in the community, and it's a big topic for um, both our government customers and just for, in general, um, out in the tech world right now, so software supply chain security uh, and building secure pipelines, having providence from what you, what is sourced from and what you build to and being able to attest um, the state of things as it was in a build pipeline are all super important. So what are the things that we've cared a lot about and we've had in the backlog for since last year was uh, when we started Zarf was to have providence around what we bring in. Uh, so there's things we do like we we always check SHA sums of things both on package create and package deploy to make sure that thing was tampered with. Um, we're heading towards signing of the actual Zarf package itself. Um, and, and this particular release for SBOM is every Zarf package is built now when there are OCI images that are pulled in, they will be analyzed with SIFT um, using Testify 6 Witness as a wrapper for that. And so we will go and catalog what we can find in the image and bun that both as a JSON that you can consume in some automation. And also we've introduced this, this kind of um, very, very lightweight portable viewer um, to show the content. So I'm going to first uh, just look at a Zarf package real quick. So this is a Normal Zarf package, uh, Postgres operator has several images in it and several charts, so it's a good example. You can see the images listed here. So we're going to build this package in a Zarf. Um, you can do Zarf package create, or you could do Zarf, Zarf YAML. They both end up in the same place. It's gonna say, hey, this is what you're wanting to build. Is that right? Uh, we're gonna say yes. Um, and so we'll just go ahead and proceed. Uh, one note here, this does say architecture AMD64. I'm actually on a M1 Mac right now, which is ARM based, um, but this package definition itself, if you look back at the, the, the YAML here, actually requires AMD64 because it uses Iron Bank images from the Air Force and those are AMD64 only currently, and that's these registry one images. So this package only works on AMD64. It actually won't run on my Mac, um, but just to show you what the experience with a good example package. We'll go through this. Um, so you have all these different images. We're going to say, yes, let's go ahead and create it. Um, and so it's going to go pull down the charts and, and the images right now to pull all that stuff, normal, typical Zarf things. And then once the packages are pulled down, it's going to have SIFT go through and catalog the images. And we're going to take all that and inject it into the tarball along with some pre-packaged um, wet viewer stuff we'll show in a second. And we did work some to make this um, the cache list as fast as possible because it is it's a lot it's doing. So we've we've really tried to tweak the caching to make this as low impact as possible to package creators. Um, but you know we expect a lot of this will happen in the pipeline anyway. So maybe it won't matter at all. But for those of us in dev sitting here waiting for it, we've, we're cognizant of of the extra delay. Um, okay, so the packages are built uh, and we have these images in there. If we wanted to, we could go and inspect this. Um, so just to see what's inside of here. Um, I can do a Zarf tools archiver. This is long, but it's it's a um, it's the mhold archivers um, library we vendor it in. We can take the package and let's just call it um, look uh, look at s bomb. Okay, so we're gonna go 
look at the SBOM here. And as you can see from the package contents here, you have the components with their um, image tarballs and their chart tarballs. And you have some manifests in there. And then you have these JSON files and these uh, HTML files here. Now the JSON files, if you were to look at these, they're, they're completely massive. Some of these several megs large. Um, so some of the larger packages like Big Bang can have a couple hundred megs of just raw JSON, which is pretty insane. Uh, but just, just to look at one, if we were to look at the, uh, let's see here, that's a smaller one. I think the PG admin, admin one isn't too bad. Okay, so we'll just look at this real quick. And as you can see, that's a lot of stuff. Um, so so looking at the the contents here and the the SBOM produced from SIFT and through Witness, we it's a lot. Uh, so we what we wanted to do was to try to produce some more value from that and also make it um, natural to the flow of package deployments. So what that looks like, I'm gonna go back out here and I'm going to remove this thing. If I can type right. Uh, okay, so now if we were to go Zarf package deploy or Zarf package in this case, and it'll prompt us, but there's a new prompt here in version 18 and it's this yellow here. So that this, the rest of the stuff is a normal, you've always seen that with package deploy, it's saying, hey, do you want to de deploy this thing that's bundled in here? And, and as a reminder, um, the way that Zarf works, what you're seeing on the screen right now is what it's going to do. It doesn't matter if somebody moved a file inside the archive or tampered with it, that actually doesn't drive the instructions. What drives the instructions is what you're presented right here. So Zarf's configuration is actually driven from the file you're being presented. So immediately after you say yes, it's going to be taking what it is dumped to you and running that. So all those instructions are actually printed on screen. So you know exactly what it's doing. It's the equivalent to like, if it was a bash script, reading the bash script first before you said continue. And the idea was we wanted to make sure you knew what you were getting. Um, so following that, that train of thought, uh, with SBOM, the software build materials, we want to do the same thing. So what we do here is we both put it in this directory temporarily where you deployed, we call it Zarf SBOM, while you're doing the deploy process. And we also give you a link conveniently to one of the SBOMs that you can click on. So I'm just going to open this one up right here. And, and so what we have now um, is, is a very basic viewer to let us see the contents of the software build materials. Now, an interesting one, pause, is empty. Right, there's nothing in that one. It does say undefined, which isn't beautiful, but there's nothing there. But if you look at other images here, you start to see contents like you can sort it by uh, the, the name. You can search for like, the example you use is like SSL. I can go look at SSL and filter on that. And um, if there are larger groups, you could paginate it and you know change the, the sizing of your page, the typical table behavior you would expect. And then you can do things like um, see some notes in the case of um, Alpine images. They always put notes here, which is convenient. Not all of them have this, um, but some notes, the maintainer, um, and then you can even look at like what files were listed there. So that's kind of handy. Um, and different distros have different information you get, um, but we can switch between all the images in this package. So like the Iron Bank images from NIO, for example. Notice there's no notes or maintainers or size because that data is not provided to us, um, but we can search for like um, from Python for example, or from the RPMs or even from Go modules. And we can start to see like what's being brought in, what it found. Um, and and there's, there's still quite a bit obviously here um, that this thing is finding instead of this image. So we, we get to see a lot of data about what's in there. And, and the use case could, could be like the Log4j example is pretty famous now, right? So what version of Log4j am I bringing in here? Well, I could go look at that if there was a Java package in here in theory. Um, so that's that's the power of this is a JSON is a JSON, right? And we don't know where you're deploying. We don't want to require you to have extra dependencies to deploy. Um, so if you're in an air gap, if you're in a submarine, if you're in like an isolated bare metal environment or even on a cloud environment, we just want to give you a lightweight way to see the software build materials as our package. We still can include the raw JSON you can look at or consume through automation. But we wanted a way to share um, more data quickly with you. Um, and you can take this this folder and, and move it around. And, and so just to look at this um, somewhere else, we can go over here and see that right now, um, if we look at the example, we're in the Postgres operator with this temporary SBOM directory. And, and all it is um, is just a bunch of HTML files. They're all 
self-contained HTML. We're using, I believe it's, um, I believe it's called Simple Tables. This is a JavaScript library, but basically it's a single static HTML file with everything you need in it, including the embedded JSON, um, for you to load up the bill of materials and, and do the filtering and sorting the things that we, we just saw and all these are the same. And that's all built automatically by Zarf when you do package create. So when you do package deploy, all you're doing is basically loading a HTML file in your browser. Um, or of course you could still do, you know, JQ and grep and, and all that stuff. So we're gonna say no here and just let that be removed. Um, so that's done now. Um, but that's that's the, the build materials feature. It's, we expect it to, to become more robust and we did look at like embedded servers that seem more complex than the solution. Um, and we've been looking for open source tools to render um, SIFT output or other SBOM output. And, and we're keeping an eye on things like dependency track and a few other tools out there that, that maybe we could consider in the future. But we wanted something that was super lightweight and instantaneous real visualization of, of what you're seeing in the bill of materials and, and not just a massive, you know, JSON dump. Even if you parse it through JQ and grep it, it's still, it's, it's still some work. Um, so that's the SBOM feature. Another big one um, that we've added here is the the cosine uh, feature. So um, we've added cosine for validating binaries. You know, Zarf has always done things like validate the um, the SHA sum of binaries. So you specify that, and it'll check that on package create and package deploy. Cosine is another layer we can do to that. And so the, the Zarf injector actually uses the um, this new cosine feature to validate its binary. So Zarf injector is the REST binary that we use to kind of bootstrap a cluster. And that is now built through automation on our pipeline, pushed and signed to Docker Hub. And then whenever you do a package create on the init package, which is something that we do, typically not, not a user would do because we publish that for you. Um, what we're doing is we're validating the, the checksums of those on the package create. And so what that looks like, uh, just to go back here is, if we were to look at this Zarf, actually it's under um, packages and the injector Zarf YAML, and if we were to YQ this, you can see this, um, we're pointing to this cosine pub, which is our public key for cosine. And then it's pointing to this sgit, which is a new URL source you could do in files um, because you can do like real pass or you can do um, HTTPS now you can also do sgit, and this is going to pull that down um, via cosine to actually pull it from the registry and verify it, um, and then if it passes, apply it. And so um, I'll show an example of that as well in a second. Um, we can see that through one of the steps from a different deployment, but but there's a couple annotations it adds. It checks annotations and it checks a few other pieces there to make sure that it's actually uh, the appropriate uh, package asset that we were expecting. So that's cool. Um, this version also, we go from Go 16 to Go 18, and there's a ton of library updates. You can check uh, the release notes on that. Um, so if you look at the release notes and just compare um, the Go mod from Go, uh, from version 17 to version 18, you'll see that we went from Go 16 to Go 18. We added um, testify sec, we added cosine, uh, and a couple other things in there to make all the new features work. And we bumped every dependency we could up to its latest stable version, uh, trying to keep everything up to date. Um, so that's that's just normal, you know, good hygiene as far as patching things. Um, and the other big feature that we've added this this round is we've added a read-only Git user. So if you're using the GitOps setup, if you're doing deploying Giddy, um, you have a new feature here. And so I have, and so the screen here, I've already deployed under a K3D cluster. In the background, I deployed um, this, and we're, we're already connected to the registry right now via via Zarf Connect Git. And so I've logged into two different screens here. This, we have a read-only and a, a read-write user on the same repo. So whenever you push things to Zarf, Zarf automatically pushes the repo with the read-write user, and it, uh, it um, assigns the read-only user to that repo as well. So that now you can do things like for Flux or Argo or Fleet or whatever your GitOps total choice is, you can give it the read-only user account um, versus a read-write user account, um, which just is a, a safety feature so that if somehow that key was compromised, they couldn't push anything up to the Git repo because it's just a read-only key. And so what that looks like here is I am logged in right now 
with the Zarf Git user, looking at this pod info pod, and you can see I can create new files, upload things. I have read write access here, and I also have the Zarf Git read user logged in. Um, and you'll notice that it's a read only. There's a lot of the buttons are gone and the features are gone. Same repo, same URL, different logins, different permissions, automatically handled by Zarf for you. All you have to do is just pass the credentials to whatever you need to consume it. Uh, so that was a, an important feature. We're going to do the same thing for the registry. We're not there yet. That's going to be a little more complex because we have to rewrite the chart a little bit um, to actually make that work because it's just it's not supported by this. The, the login method we use right now does not support that out of the box. So we have to do some more work there to make that work. Also, another feature we did was there's this new flag for customize allow any directory if you're using customizations. Uh, this is a feature request that came up recently where someone needed to import uh, files from a different path than the actual customize. And customize blocks this because in theory you could use that to go and sneakily grab files you shouldn't be grabbing, um, like a, a secret or, or some private file. So they want to prevent that. And so we agree with that because when our prompts you to deploy something, it shows you a list of the customized things it's using, but not the, the imports of customize itself. So we've added this new flag called customize allow uh, any directory. Uh, if you set that to true, that package can then pull files from elsewhere. And what this does for you as a package creator is it's a flag to say, oh, this is pulling from some other location. I should go look at that, you know, or not. And usually this, this isn't a major security threat because typically you're authoring packages and pu publishing those packages up for other people to consume. But um, if you did distribute as RF YAML, excuse me, for other people to package themselves, this is something we want to be aware of. So we've added this flag to make it very clear before the user does anything, before they fetch any files that that we're allowing this, this override behavior. We didn't want to put this as a flag because that would make it hard for onboarding for new users. So, so this is where that's at. Um, and that's in this version as well. Okay, uh, last change I think we have is we've we've added the ability to f do a, a flag for script timeouts and, and for customizing that. And, and basically, instead of Zarf, um, you can have scripts that run before or after a component and they can, they can do things like, for, for example, um, for K3S, we actually use that um, and I'm going to go ahead and just destroy this real quick. Destroy, confirm, while, we're, while I'm talking. Okay, so, so normally you can, um, you can still create these scripts to do before and after, um, but there was a, a kind of fixed timeout with them. It wasn't very good. Um, it, it had a lot of kind of edge cases, so we kind of rewrote the entire scripts component. So now there's a real timeout. If you say, I think the default timeout is five minutes for scripts. Um, and if it takes one of those five minutes for a script to run, it times out unless you override that. Um, but with the override, there's also a flag to show the logs. Um, so while this is running, I'll show you packages, distros, EKS. We have this new package um, we put together for some, uh, for some folks to show them how to, you could use Zarf to deploy EKS using EKS CTL. Um, so inside of here, if you look at the package, sorry, YAML, and we will just YQ that again. Um, you'll see the, you know, there's these settings here uh, for show output and timeout second of, uh, in seconds of one hour. And so what this allows us to do is for those very long running scripts that, that need to operate and show you output as, as they're running, this allows you to just um, specify that in the package as a package author, it sort of actually works. For example, this, this particular Zarf package, when you run it, it takes anywhere between 15 and 40 minutes, depending on um, your configuration, what the node pool you're using, and a few other things. So, so it can take a while. We were running that on GovCloud. I think it took us about 40 minutes for it to actually run um, through once. So, so that, that, that's a, a piece of data for everyone that this is a new feature if you're authoring packages. You can now have a little bit more control over how those scripts are actually run and how they behave.